Poop, Graham. <sighs> so that's the sound of a tired monkey. That's a monkey. No, actually, here we go. A cicada monkey. Well, I used to read a children's book to my daughters about a guy who sold hats. Hats for sale. He would pile them all in his head and then he went to sleep under a tree and then all the monkeys stole all the hats and they went up in the tree. And every time he tried to shout at them, hey, you monkeys, you know, throw down the hats, they would just go back at him. This was in a book. In a book. So yeah. how did these spell? T C H. Ah. Yeah. It's also there used to be a British comic strip called Andy Cap. He would always go, yeah. and I used to say touch. And then right. one time my dad heard me say that and he laughed. He said, "No, no, that's pronounced." I used to read as touch as well. Yeah, now I, I feel foolish. It's... Okay, there we go. So uh, Graham, uh, today's episode. Yes. We answer. We, we today's attempt... episode. We're having, actually having alcohol. That helps too. And that explains why I've forgotten to once again introduce ourselves. <laughs> introduce ourselves. I'm here with uh, Dr. Graham Sanders, yes. a professor of medieval Chinese poetry from the University of Toronto. Mm-hmm. And and I'm serving whiskey to Dr. Raywat Dean Anden, a professor of epidemiology at the University of Ottawa. I want to start off by asking Graham a question. And before I do so, I want to point out that today's topic was suggested by a reader on Facebook. Mm-hmm. We have Facebook fans now. We Graham. do. And Heather on Facebook says, I have questions that I would really like an epidemiologist take on. Hmm. For instance, I've read reports of studies on the long-term effects of annual flu shots. Some have been positive, some negative. Are any of them real? Has a flu vaccine been around long enough to see results? So I wanted to talk about vaccine safety in general, flu vaccine safety. And what was the crux of the question? The safety? The, what did she actually ask? Well, she's asking a couple of things. Okay. And one of them is, has the flu vaccine been around long enough to see results? Results and for what? Efficacy or danger? Safety, I assume. Okay. And the other thing she's asking around uh, are these long-term effects of the flu vaccine, are right. they real? Now, we're not going to answer either one of those questions. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> I want to know whether they actually prevent flus or not. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> that's yeah. my major question about <laughs> But I want to ask, start up by asking you, Graham, how many people do you think die every year from influenza in from Canada? From influenza in Canada every year. Well, I know the Spanish flu killed millions and millions. Right. The Spanish flu, though, was a unique strain. Was it? An unusual strain. It's like some sort of super strain? Well, it's very similar to H1N1. Okay. So this is what I don't get. I doubt many people just get a flu and drop dead. I think it's like old people in nursing homes, people in hospitals, very young children who are getting flus and either their immune systems are, are adequate or their, their respiratory system is compromised already and the flu is the straw that breaks the camel's back. Sure. Are those counted as flu deaths? Uh, they might be. It depends what you mean by flu death. So is it I'm not afraid of flu. I, I don't think a flu is going to come along and, I'm, and strike me dead and I'm going to fall down. I mean, I'm a relatively healthy person, so I'll get very sick, mm-hmm. but I'm not afraid of dying from flu. So the people who are dying from flus are, are weakened for some reason. That's correct. If we include those people, then it's a larger number. I'll say 500 people a year. Okay, well, Health Canada always claims around 2,000 to 8,000 2, 8, flu deaths per year. That's what's commonly cited. and That sounds really high. It is really high, and I don't think it's a real number, quite honestly. Yeah. I think it's based on computer modeling, not on actual disease surveillance. Oh, so it's a dry lab. It's a dry <laughs> lab sort of uh, number. This has created a lot of anger in the anti-vaccination camp mm-hmm. around the inflated estimates of the danger posed by the flu mm-hmm. as compared to the dangers posed by the vaccine. And I try to look for the actual numbers of deaths, specific numbers not modeled or reported in Canada. And I have uh, something here from health Ca- from the Public Health Agency of Canada that looked at um, hospitalizations and deaths caused by the flu over pre- right. rare, rare years. So in 2014, 2015, it looks like there are almost 8,000 hospitalizations of adults in Canada. And okay. that same year, there are about 600 deaths. There are all sorts of variables at play here. So I think a flu vaccine is warranted if it can prevent hospitalizations. I don't think we have to measure everything as deaths. Right? Right. So if a flu vaccine can keep people from getting sick, keep people from going into the hospital, that not only reduces suffering for the individuals, it takes a load off of the healthcare system because you don't have all these people that are hospitalized. Now, if the anti-vaccine people are only measuring deaths, then that's so arguing across purposes. And also, 
How many people die from a vaccine? So now you're getting at, at the crux of, yeah. of the issue here is we have an indicator for the results that we want, mm-hmm. but there must also be an indicator for risk. Is the rewards of vaccination, whether it be reduced hospitalization, reduced deaths, reduced cost, right. warranted given the risk? Yes. But what is the risk? Right. So what are the risks of the flu vaccine? Well, the ones that we know about when we go to the clinic, as you got your flu vaccine this year? Yes. As did I. They tell you, you know, you might have some soreness. Maybe you'll have flu-like symptoms yes. for an evening. You know, you know, it's not the flu per se. It's no. flu-like symptoms. Right. That sort of thing. But there are some more serious risks as well. Probably the most serious one is, do you know what the most serious one is? They talk about a fever, but... There's a disease. Mm-hmm. It's called a Guillain-Barre syndrome. Ah. You've heard of that, right? Yeah, I have. It's, it's a rapid onset muscle weakness right. disease uh, caused by damage to the immune system. So I'm making this noise here by crumpling some plastic. Yeah. I put that away. Being neurotic again. <laughs> and the thing is that they think about one in a million people who get the flu vaccine mm-hmm. will get Guillain-Barre syndrome. And you may ask yourself, is that a, a warranted risk? How many people get Guillain-Barre syndrome in the population? <clears throat> in general, I think less than one in a million. Mm-hmm. So there is a heightened risk associated with right. the flu vaccine. Yeah. However, mm-hmm. however, you can get it from the flu as well. Right. If you get the flu, your risk of getting Guillain-Barre syndrome is about one in 60,000. Right. So there's a higher risk of getting the syndrome if you get the flu <laughs> than if you become immune to the flu via right. the vaccine. So in other words, if you get the vaccine and it's effective you have a lower chance of getting Guillain-Barre syndrome. That's right. right. But the additional question would have to be, what are your chances of getting the flu in general? Right, yeah. So if your chances are low, then you it's not worthwhile getting the flu vaccine to prevent the Guillain-Barre syndrome mm-hmm. heightened risk from right. the flu right. itself. But this is one of the things where, as an epidemi- epidemiologist, it's only significant across a, a broad population, right? So we're not talking about individuals anymore. So the flu vaccine only makes sense to me when you tar- start talking about thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people. I don't really care whether one individual's chances are decreased or increased. or, But if you can prove to me that a broad population, you'll reduce the incidence of flu by introducing the flu vaccine, that's good enough for me. Now, everyone thinks about what does it do for me. They don't think about what it does for the Yeah, population so when we do these mass modeling exercises, we really can't predict the experiences of an individual. Yeah. On the other hand, this is a game of return on investment mm-hmm. and risk. Yeah. So where, what is the threshold? What is the amount of risk that, um, that when reached, makes it inapplicable? to? It, to in other words, one in a million is a risk that I'm willing to pay right. uh, in order to get the benefits of the flu vaccine. Okay, in, so let's think of it this way then. Uh, again, I'm playing devil's advocate, yeah. obviously. In a population of 30 million people, which is mm-hmm. what we have, we're saying then 30 people will get this horrible disease, and let's say it's fatal. Right. So you're saying you're killing 30 people so that everyone can be immune from a disease that will probably kill 600. Okay, 30 people. Okay. But then you just told me that if you get the flu, <laughs> yeah. you actually might have an increased chance of That's getting right. much more than one in a million. Okay. So what if you factor that in? So what if I say, then you have to look at if you don't vaccinate this population and they get the flu and they get the it's going to be a lot higher. higher. Yeah, that's right. correct. So I'm still going to vote for the vaccine. And good for you. I think that is the right answer. And, and good for you for thinking of you mathematically like that. So obviously, this is the, the kind of mental gymnastics. That doesn't gymnastics. help the 30 people who die from the that's right. I know. So if you're one of those people, of course, you're going to shout very loudly yeah. at the media and say, you people killed my baby. Yeah. You know, A good analogy might be the seatbelts. So seatbelts right. are going to save a lot of lives. Right. The occasional person will be strangled by strangled the seatbelt. Strangled by seatbelt, yeah. yeah. So is it worthwhile for that person? No. It's the same with airbags. Airbags. Airbags have been known to kill people, decapitate people, and so forth. I always get a little angry at public health types who quite vociferously and authoritatively state the flu vaccine is absolutely safe and you anti-vaccination people are just crazy. Mm. I don't think that's respectful. I don't think that helps the conversation at all. There is a small risk, Mm -hmm. right? And the question is how much risk is acceptable for an individual versus what's appropriate for the population. For example, children have a special kind of risk that's mm-hmm. different from adults. Mm-hmm. Children have a small risk of febrile seizure, right. you know, in certain cases. And a lot of anti-vaccination people are concerned about, you know, what's inside the vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. We just uh, we just had a walk, just now, Graham and I, and, and, and he was saying that people are mostly concerned about, you know, the toxic elements that might be inside vaccination. And my response was, let's say vaccinations were made of 
mother's love and Christmas and joy, mm-hmm. right? All the good things in life. How I do still you extract think, that. We extract it uh, probably rectally. <laughs> and <laughs> of course you would. <laughs> <laughs> and even if it's made of all that good stuff, oh. there will still be people who would be opposed to it because because it's a shot that's going into your arm and you're introducing a foreign. It's external. Foreign sort of uh, body into your body. It's something about injecting something into you, which, which immediately makes people a suspect, and, and understandably so. Sure. A lot of people point their finger at thimerosal, which is a kind of mercury additive, mm. right? And that's, that's meant to be a preservative. And the reason we need thimerosal or things like it in a vaccine is it's possible for the vaccine to become contaminated with bacteria or fungi. And that's very dangerous. You don't want to be injecting yourself with some kind of disease-making pathogen. A sterilizing component is included. Mm -hmm. People are afraid of thimerosal because it's mercury. We all know mercury is bad. Right. But it's a kind of mercury that has never been shown to be biologically problematic. It's Mm -hmm. called ethyl mercury. Right. Whereas the kind of mercury that we find in fish or in the environment that Mm -hmm. make people sick is methyl mercury. Okay. So we have to keep that separate. Also, a lot of vaccines have formaldehyde also as a preservative. And nobody wants to inject themselves with formaldehyde. Yeah, sounds terrible. However, formaldehyde occurs naturally in our bodies. Yeah. So it's not a foreign substance necessarily. And again... And I assume we're talking about very small amounts. Very small amounts, right. Some vaccines contain aluminum, which, Mm -hmm. you know, has degenerative uh, neurological effects. Alzheimer's. Right, it's a problem. uh, However, in Ontario, where we live, there are no vaccines with aluminum. Okay. This is something that doesn't affect us at all. I think a rational way of thinking about those kinds of risks, though, have to do with bioaccumulation. Mm. So if you're going to have a vaccine every year, does it actually accumulate over time and mm-hmm. create problems? And we don't really know, right. to be honest. So the, the, that goes back to Heather's question about have these vaccines been around long enough for yeah. us to measure whether they're really safe or not? I think they have been mm-hmm. because we've been having vaccinations for decades mm-hmm. and we have long-term adverse reaction results. How do you think we have this information, by the way? I ask my students this all the time. Yeah, where where do you think this information comes from? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I'm assuming that when vaccinations are given, there has to be some sort of record that's sent back to a government body. Yeah, we assume a lot from our government, don't we? Yeah. We have these mechanisms in population health sciences called surveillance programs. And it sounds very ominous, doesn't it? Big brothery surveillance. And there are various ways of doing disease surveillance. There's active surveillance and passive surveillance. Mm-hmm. Active surveillance is when I, meaning the government, goes out and gets the information. Maybe I send out a survey, maybe I've got a team in the, you know, in the mall that's going to stop people and ask them questions. That's right. very active. Passive surveillance is when I sit back and the information comes to me. So we have a thing in most, you know, um, wealthy countries called the notifiable disease registry. Right. That's a list for of, measles and things like that. Right. So it's, it's a list of diseases that we believe are so important that every time somebody in the healthcare profession comes across one, they must report it. Yeah. As a result, for those diseases, we have a pretty solid idea of how many cases there are. I remember are. once one of my daughters got some spots on her skin, and I just mentioned to the secretary at school, oh, I wonder if it's measles or not. And instantly she was pulled from school. They called the, the health yeah. board and... I said, and it was a, I had to fill out a report. And I was like, oh, I shouldn't have opened my mouth. <laughs> but I'm, I'm yeah. glad that, there's, that they were doing their jobs. So. Yeah, so we have these methods of surveillance. Mm-hmm. So in Canada and the U.S., we have another surveillance program called, it's called different things in both countries, but it's a kind of post-vaccination adverse reaction surveillance system. Right. Is that where they tell you to stay around for 15 minutes after you had your vaccine? You stay around not for the surveillance system, mm-hmm. but to see if there's an adverse right. reaction. The adverse reaction could be something like headedness, maybe mm-hmm. a more serious reaction. But if you have your shot and you go home, how are they going to find out about that? Only if you have an encounter with the healthcare system. And only so it has to be bad enough for you to... Sure. So there could be some mild adverse reactions exactly. that are going on. Exactly. So it's not a precise mm-hmm. problem. But as, to answer how this question here, we even though the vaccines haven't been around for hundreds of years, they've been around for many years, and we have the surveillance system for many years. Mm-hmm. So the extent to which that very large sensitive system is able to detect adverse reactions, we know whether or not bad things have happened. Okay. The other question then... I don't know whether Heather was asking this, but is there a cumulative effect of having multiple vaccinations year after year after year? In my mind, all a vaccination does is introduce a dead version of the virus to allow your body to have immune response to that. Mm -hmm. So that if the live version of the virus comes along, it's already primed to attack that virus. 
So I don't see any problem with that because our immune system is doing that all the time. Sure. We're always encountering things and, and reacting to them. But is there something else in a vaccine which could accumulate over time? That's right. So to shots? back up for a second, when you talk about the dead viruses, we call it an, usually it's an attenuated mm-hmm. biological organism. Mm-hmm. So the attenuation it can either be dead or it could be impaired. Okay. We don't really do that a lot anymore. Now, most modern vaccines mm-hmm. contain an antigen, which is a protein fragment from the surface of the disease. That's all it's required? That's right. So, Because oh. so, the way your immune system recognizes oh. an invader, it's yeah. by these antigens on the surface of the cells. Oh, okay. So now you're taking so just... You're just showing them in the face. You don't, Precisely. Yeah, you don't need the yeah. entire body. Precisely. Okay. Huh. So it, it is physically impossible to be infected right. by the vaccine. Right. There are some vaccines still that have actual uh, organisms. Mm-hmm. I think the rabies vaccine might. I'm not sure. Right. They're, they're pretty rare and they're expensive. But in general, the new ones don't even contain organisms. So that would suggest to me that there's really very little risk of sure. a long-term cumulative effect. Based on our understanding of the science. However, you, the bioaccumulation issue would come into play with things like the ethyl mercury. The additives. Right, yeah. the additives and things like that. And again, we don't know yet and studies are, are being done. Now, uh, I want to segue to okay. our rigorous and ridiculous, ridiculous section. Rigorous or ridiculous. Sorry, rigorous. <laughs> Sometimes they're both. <laughs> and, and still on the same topic. Um, so let's, let's put, ooh, I'm opening open. up some chocolate to go with the whiskey. Yes. Sweet, sweet. <laughs> Can't have one without the other. <laughs> okay. We should play our theme music now, starting yes. now as I eat my chocolate. As we eat the chocolate. Mm, chocolate. Mm, it's hazelnut. And dark chocolate. That's good. That's Graham's pet name for me. Dark chocolate. Mm. <laughs> we don't have just one paper this time. It's a, a, a set of papers. Oh, no. But um, I've sent Graham one of them. The one I think I sent him was called uh, Increased Incidence in Clinical Picture of Childhood Narcolepsy. So I have to put all these along a spectrum of rigorous, rigorous, ridiculous. Well, um, this is the PLOS one one? That's right. Okay. And this Public is the- Library of Science. Mm-hmm. This is a fine journal. So this is a plausible study. Wow. (laughs) I just swallow my chocolate here before I mumble more words. Mm. A lot of Finnish people in this study, judging by all the consonants and all the Ks. You know what they call the border between Finland and Russia? What? The Finnish line. Ah. You know how you you can tell a Finnish man likes you? Yeah. He looks at your shoes when he talks to you. (laughs) You're looking at angry emails from Finland now. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we're a, we're a hell sunk oh man yeah, okay <laughs> fjording ahead oh boy this particular paper and others like it um are exploring a phenomenon that was observed in 2009 2010 which is relevant to have this question still mm-hmm. and the phenomenon was an observed increase in childhood narcolepsy Exactly. And narcolepsy is the tendency to fall asleep at inopportune moments. That was my imitation of a child. <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, listener, that noise did not come out of his head. <laughs> that was the juvenile howler monkey. <laughs> this and is so weird. So getting the flu shot puts you to sleep. This is know? what I'm saying. So yeah. the study found that there's an association between getting the H1N1 pandemic vaccination in 2009. What was the popular name for H1N1? Was it the uh, bird avian flu? flu? Avian, avian flu. flu. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And Which what, came I, from Hong Kong originally, right? There's a whole other topic we can talk because about. Because apparently the way you te- check the freshness of a live chicken at a market is you blow up its butt and see how it reacts. The inhalation... Did a Catholic priest tell you this one day, Graham? <laughs> and so apparently the practice of blowing up a chicken's butt mm. puts you at risk for contracting avian flu. Yeah. I'm just <laughs> contributing what I can contribute from the As an aside, East Asian um, studies. one of the reasons that... The, the flu vaccine every year in North America is a bit of a gamble in the mm. sense that... That's um, a good question. Why? Uh, every year I ask them that. I get, I, ask, I get the shot, then I say, what's the efficacy of this? And they go, well, they didn't guess very well this year. Or, oh, they're, they're right on this year. So what's the discrepancy that... Uh, the flu organism mm-hmm. uh, evolves, well, evolves not the right word, changes right. every year. And one of the reasons for that is it originates from Asia. That's weird in and of itself. Is that something to do with climate? No, it doesn't. It, like why does it always come from Because that? of the close association between large populations uh-huh. and certain domestic animals. Ah, including and, the chickens. And chickens and And pigs. the butt blowing. That's the problem. They really should cut that Stop out. Stop judging my lifestyle, Graham. <laughs> You're not qualified to pass judgment on me and 
my lifestyle. There's a word for diseases that come from the animal kingdom and enter into human populations. Do you know what that word is? I want to say like trans species or something. It's or... zoonosis. Yeah, that's okay. That's, and and most of the most that's what uh, I said. Uh, virulent or problematic diseases in human history have been zoonoses. Mm. Uh, and the flu is AIDS is zoonosis, isn't it? According to popular theory, yes, yeah. it originated from chimps mm-hmm. or some kind of a simian population. Right. And uh, maybe someone ate some chimp meat, or maybe someone did something else untoward. Bush meat. With a, a monkey or an ape that we won't discuss. Population, density, domestic mm-hmm. animals. There's like a high instance of incubation of okay. new viruses in Asia. There are flu organisms, influenza viruses, that exist within human realm. There's influenza viruses that are passed between birds and passed between pigs. Mm-hmm. Occasionally, they find a way to jump species. Mm-hmm. Now, if they jump species and communicate with one of the organisms that are common in the human experience, right. they can share DNA, mm-hmm. and suddenly they find a way to exist in both. And they're mm-hmm. the ones we're terrified of. That's when the, the, the pandemic flus arise. Our international organizations, like WHO, keeps a close eye mm-hmm. on big populations like China to see if such an ordeal, such a manifestation will, will emerge. Mm-hmm. And if that's the case, uh, entire populations of birds are destroyed right. to prevent that happening. So on a year-to-day basis, we observe what the most prevalent strains are in Asia, and we make estimates about what they will be like when they reach the Western world. So which ones will actually... Be so problem. are you predicting which ones will jump to humans? No, by the time this, are, this they've process already jumped. Yeah, happens, they've already jumped. In, so then you're predicting which ones which will actually migrate to other yes. parts of the world. Yes, they're all going to migrate. Now, what proportion will they be in by the time it gets to North America? Right. So the one from last year will still be here. Right. The one from two years ago will still be here. Right. But now the new one will arrive as right. well. So every year uh, a conference is struck at uh-huh. some time in the year. And, and the experts decide, we think this formulation for this year must include this, 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 and this, based upon what we've observed right. in Asia. And you have a certain number of months now to manufacture the vaccine. Right. That's where the discrepancy comes exactly. in. Exactly. Okay. If you could do it overnight, no problem. If they could speed it up, then... Okay. So, so every year there is a bit of a gamble. And some years it's not close. And some years it's bang on. Okay. What I've read, I think, usually we get somewhere between 60 and 75% accuracy. Right. Okay. Right. So that's why it's not quite as efficacious. as. It's still opinion. enough to warrant taking the getting the vaccine. I, I believe think. so, yeah. uh, in absence of any other information yeah. about... And as long as we can assume that no damage is being done to you otherwise. That's right. Yeah, and as we mentioned, the bioaccumulation issues are still not as well known as perhaps they could be, uh, according to my reading anyway. Well, then you have to measure, like, okay, I'm 90 and I'm dying from some bioaccumulation issue, but because I had a vaccine every year, I didn't get... 30 bouts of flu that I may have gotten otherwise. Sure. You know, I'm willing to pay that price. <laughs> you should be the spokesperson for public health in Canada. You really phrase these things in a compelling way. Mm. So going back to the paper here, and this is one of several of the same topic, what they've done is they've observed a strong association between the H1N1 pandemic vaccine mm. in 2009 and an increased incidence of... Falling asleep as a kid. Of falling asleep as a kid, right. Or otherwise known as childhood narcolepsy. The vaccine used there was something called Pandemrix, and Pandemrix is a... You know, it's not such a bad thing if your child falls asleep. (laughs) Many parents desire that. (laughs) So this this could actually be a selling point of the flu vaccine. (laughs) Not only will they not get the flu, they'll actually fall asleep more readily. (laughs) Where do I sign up? I think I'm detecting an association between our content that is legally actionable (laughs) and how much we're drinking at the time. (laughs) This is actually very logical. <laughs> There's a host of, of studies that uh, are designed in a variety of ways. Some of them, for example, look at people who already are narcoleptic mm-hmm. and compare them to those who aren't, mm-hmm. and then determine whether or not they were exposed to the flu vaccine earlier. Okay. Right? Yeah. Others looked at population averages mm-hmm. to see we, we saw a spike in narcolepsy this year that coincided with the arrival of the vaccine. Right. And others looked uh, in a longitudinal sense. Mm-hmm. We have these individuals who didn't have narcolepsy, some got the flu vaccine, and those who did had a higher incidence of narcolepsy a year later. And all of them showed some kind of association between... All three of these populations. All three has showed something resembling it, right? Like I said, there's like uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. There's like 10, over 10 studies looked at uh, both children and adults to see if there's an association. 
And they all find a meaningful risk. I'll spoil the results for you okay. a bit and say... You were asking if this is ridiculous or, that's or right. rigorous. I want to say that this has been redone since to address some of the flaws that I hope you will identify. When you say redone, yeah. is that like a meta study where they look at all... Or did they actually Both. go out and measure these um, results again? A meta study where mm-hmm. they've done more advanced statistics to control okay. for some of these issues. Uh, and they found that the effect is real, though not as strong not as previously strong. estimated. Okay. So the educational component of today's broadcast then is, can you think of some of the issues that may pop up in preventing this from right. being as rigorous as it may otherwise appear? It sounds like to me what you're saying is the only real risk of getting the flu vaccine is you might have a touch of narcolepsy. Sure. I mean, I wouldn't want to be narcoleptic. I mean, has there been any other study that shows flu vaccine leads to Anything else? Look at it this way, though. You already said earlier that you don't mind getting the flu mm-hmm. as an individual. Mm-hmm. So you probably would mind falling asleep every day in opportune moments. This is so hard because it just comes down to my right as an individual versus my concern for the population in general. Sure. And I, I strongly believe that vaccines are good and warranted and everyone should have them, but, but they only work if the population en masse receives them. Then, on the other side, if we constantly think about, well, what's my individual risk? There are all sorts of reasons we can think about. Like, I don't want to take, I don't want to have this vaccine. Right. Then I'd have to know, well, like, what's what's the risk of my getting a narcolepsy from this vaccine? Is that addressed in these studies? Is it, like, is, uh, it, is it one in a million? It probably is it has been. Thing? Well, I didn't read things for thrill, to be honest. Yeah. Before we get into the ethics okay. of it all, I mean, one of the okay, things the studies themselves. that I was hoping you'd yeah. extract from this, and probably I didn't give you enough information to allow you to do so, okay. but they're classic epidemiological failures. Uh, having to do with bias and confounding. Conf- bias and confounding. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and there are all kinds of different biases here. Anyone that is narcoleptic, a good portion of those, probably over half of those people are going to be vaccinated. Anyway. Okay. So, yes, that's a selection bias. So, yeah. and we like to, I think, might be a version of something I call Berkson's bias. And mm-hmm. that's where people who have more than one condition are more likely to be identified. Right. right? For example, if you're in a, a hospital, you're more likely to see people who are multiply ill mm-hmm. than in the regular population. Yeah. And so you falsely assume that there's a connection between these diseases. Between these diseases. So, yeah, something similar is going on yeah. there. That's an ascertainment bias. So that would occur if the narcolepsy cases were more likely to be ca- classified as cases that they're vaccinated. Right. right. So there's other kind of bias. There's a selection bias here. What's the selection bias? What That's when that? if certain kinds of people would be preferentially enrolled. So, so how does that work in this case? Then? So maybe vaccinated cases are more likely to be in our study mm-hmm. because maybe they're more likely to volunteer. Hey, I was vaccinated. I want to be in the study, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Or the, or the opposite. Maybe unvaccinated people are, we uh, they're maybe they're healthier or something or they're, right. or they're sicker. And they say, you know, something's wrong with me. Put me in the study. Or the narcoleptics are asleep and they enroll them in the study. <laughs> <laughs> well, quick, he's, he's sleeping. Sign him up. So there's something called confounding. And in a future episode, maybe I'll go into greater depth what confounding is because mm-hmm. it, it is the serious biggest bugaboo in, in population health sciences. The example I'll give you from an educational perspective is let's say we're doing a study in a high school mm-hmm. looking at the environmental features of various classrooms. Okay. And I find that something about the classroom in the shop class is causing students there to have asthma and there's something in the environment in the English class mm-hmm. that is preventing them from having asthma. So I have a higher case instance of, of asthma in shop mm-hmm. students than those in English. Mm-hmm. Would you conclude then that maybe something in the environment in the shop class is maybe yeah. asthmatic? like sawdust or something. That makes sense, yeah. right? But there's a confounding element, and that is that the shop students are more likely to be smokers than the English students. Oh, okay. Right? So a confounding uh, variable is one that affects both the exposure and the outcome. Mm-hmm. The exposure here is which class you're in, and right. the outcome is whether or not you have asthma. Right. So in the case of these studies, there may be a confounding indicator that says maybe the thing that caused you to get vaccinated is also a thing that gives you a higher risk of narcolepsy. Why would that be? I don't know. Right. So maybe if you're at risk for narcolepsy already, maybe you're already a weak child. Or maybe it's easier to give a shot to people who are asleep. Why not? <laughs> Long story short is some new studies were brought up to control for all these biases. And I'll, I'll put a link on, uh, on the website. But it showed that even controlling for all these biases, mm-hmm. there's a small risk. To put the reader at ease, though, right. this is just a European thing. Because the European... Oh, Europeans. There it is. Oh, whatever. Right. European so, on my leg. I was going to make exactly the same joke. <laughs> <laughs> 
I was going to say European in my pants. That's the That's, whiskey talking. Yeah. There is an adjuvant. Remember, an adjuvant mm-hmm. is something added to a vaccine mm-hmm. to create an immune response in the body. To accelerate the effect of it. Precisely. There's one called AS03, Mm -hmm. and that's used in this one vaccine called Pandemrix in Europe, and that's the one that seems to be causing the problem. Mm -hmm. In the USA and Canada, there is no AS03 being used, and in fact, in fact, the CDC did their own analysis using data from their surveillance system, Ah. right? And they show that, in fact, there is zero risk for narcolepsy Mm -hmm. in our population. So in other words, when it comes down to vaccines, the actual vaccine itself is not the problem. It's the additives, which may occasionally... I would tend to agree with that. And on the whole, looking from the viewpoint of a population... Graham's always talking about the whole. The whole. Yeah. W. He's into whole. W-H-O-L. Sorry. That vaccines on the whole seem to be positive from a population point of view. I tend to agree. Yeah. Uh, there's a study that uh, a student and I did that we haven't published yet that looked at the number of polio deaths that were prevented as a result of the polio vaccine mm-hmm. in Canada. We just project into the future. Mm-hmm. And I got it published at some point. You know what? That's 33 minutes. We are well over oh. time. Okay. That's amazing. Until uh, next time, oop oop, Graham. <sighs> that is the right response. <laughs>